Welcome. I'm sort of getting sick and tired of supporters of Suspicious Observers, aka Ben Davidson, coming over to my channel and telling me to look at this or that of his videos so I can better understand how the sun works. This is rather insulting to a professional solar physicist. Ben, after all, has no qualifications in the fields of either climate or solar physics. So it is hard to see where you would have any special insight into either subject. I urge you to go look at his videos, particularly the one entitled The Variable Sun and Its Effect on Earth, and a more recent update of that called Why Global Warming Failed. The links are listed at the bottom of this image. Ben's basic thesis seems to be that he's going to prove that carbon dioxide is not causing global warming. Then he's going on to prove that it is in fact the sun that is warming the planet. The title of the 2014 Electric Universe Conference was It's All About Evidence. Ben himself says that he's going to prove the superiority of external climate forcing supported by current observations and past models. When watching his videos, listen very carefully. See how often he says something without giving any evidence to support it. In science, you usually have to look at both sides of an argument in order to come to a conclusion. Ben doesn't do this. He also claims to be independent of any economic or political strings. By the way, if you see a number in parentheses, that's the time in the video where he said that particular comment. However, that doesn't seem to be true. He only quotes the Senate Minority Report as evidence. He solicits support from the Oregon Petition, which was funded by the fossil fuel industry. And he only quotes the climate skeptics. This is not a balanced argument at all. In doing this, I think he's showing both his political and financial bias. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the evidence that Ben presents and evaluate how accurate it is. The first part is going to be about climate, which I've entitled CO2 poisoning. The second part is going to be about the sun, which I've entitled sunstroke. The third part is going to be all the additional supporting evidence that he's added, uh, which turns out not to be evidence at all. So let's get on with part one, carbon dioxide poisoning. Interestingly, Ben's presentation gives one all the symptoms of carbon dioxide poisoning. His convoluted arguments give one a headache, make you feel sick. I feel breathless and dizzy with anticipation in being able to rebut the scientific uh, nonsense that he has put in his presentation, which would cause the collapse of his case. And he does have to lose all conscience uh, in order to present this con science. Sorry, I couldn't resist all of those puns. Let's first deal with the claim that the Senate Minority Report undermines the scientific consensus on global warming. That report claims that over 700 scientists have made statements that are against anthropogenic global warming. This is not actually true. An independent review of that list showed that over 80% of them had never published anything associated with climate or a related scientific discipline. 10% of them specifically had supported anthropogenic global warming in their public statements and 8% weren't even scientists. So that does not leave a lot, does it? Of the remainder, only four are recognized climate scientists, and Ben does name these folks in the rest of his presentation. So let's take a look at the four best examples that Ben could come up with of climate scientists that are against anthropogenic global warming. So let's take a look at these four scientists individually. The first mentioned is Richard Linzen. Ben claims that Linzen is an MIT professor, but that is not true. He had to leave MIT after the rest of the climate department there signed a letter criticizing his points of view. He has now joined the Cato Institute, which is a right-wing think tank. Even so, he states that he believes in anthropogenic global warming. He just believes that it won't be as disastrous as some people claim. The second person is Pat Michaels. He actually told a meeting of the Heartland Institute on climate that anthropogenic global warming is real. Get over it. The third is John Christie, who has made several public statements criticizing the IPCC and their views. However, when testifying under oath in a court trial, he supported the IPCC views directly. John Everett is not actually a climate scientist. He's a bureaucrat who managed climate scientists. So the best four examples that Ben could come up with don't really support his case at all. If you don't believe what I've said about these scientists, please go to my video entitled global warming skeptics in their own words, and you'll actually see recordings of them saying exactly what I just mentioned. Next, Ben starts fiddling with the numbers. 
He claimed that the 31,484 signers of the Oregon petition represents a 1,000% increase in climate skepticism from the 709 used in the Senate Minority Report. This is wrong on so many different levels. First of all, the Oregon petition has been debunked so many different ways and by so many different people that it's almost a waste of time. But if you don't believe me, uh, see my video entitled 31,000 Scientists Can't All Be Wrong. You should also see the National Academy of Sciences statement about the Oregon petition, disowning it completely, because it was made to look like an output from the National Academy of Sciences. The next problem is that Ben can't do math. An increase from 709 to 31,487 is an increase of 4,441%, not 1,000. The second problem is that it isn't true, because the Oregon petition was started 10 years before the Senate report. So that would actually represent a 98% drop in climate scepticism. But of course, this comparison is completely bogus. You can't do a comparison like this unless you have the same population of people involved. And he certainly doesn't. He claims that the IPCC has overestimated the effects of anthropogenic global warming. As evidence, he brings up a study done by John Christie on tropical mid-tropospheric temperatures. The problem with this is that tropical mid-tropospheric temperatures do not represent global surface temperatures. In looking at these, you are just considering a very narrow part of the atmosphere in a very narrow range of latitudes. And global temperature models are not meant to predict these. So it's not surprising that it doesn't produce these sorts of results. Ben then returns to one of his old favourites. How the government has a, this vast conspiracy of hiding the amount of carbon dioxide there was in the past. He says, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is the lack of CO2 into the past. I want to ask the question, what lack? With just a couple of quick clicks of the mouse, I was able to find five plots of carbon dioxide going back 50 years, 400 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, and 600,000 years. Most of these were from government websites. So I again ask, what lack? What Ben is actually talking about here is the climate.gov website, which if you look at the bottom of the page shows three graphs. The top one is the average temperature. The second one is the carbon dioxide since 1957. And the third is spring snow cover. The middle one only goes back to 1957 because it is the so-called Keeling curve. And Keeling of the Scripps Institute only started measuring carbon dioxide from 19. 57 onwards. So it's rather hard to show this curve any earlier than 1957. However, as I just pointed out, the carbon dioxide data is readily available just by a single click of the mouse. And in fact, actually, if you click on the learn more button just right next to that curve, that's exactly what it says. He then goes on to show a plot like this that demonstrates the link between carbon dioxide and global temperatures. He then adds in the modern day level of carbon dioxide and uses this to prove that the link between carbon dioxide and global temperatures is now broken, therefore concluding that carbon dioxide is not creating the change in global temperatures that we're currently seeing. This is a trick because although he's put in the modern day levels of carbon dioxide, he hasn't put in the modern day levels of temperature. And if you plot them together with the same time resolution, you get something like this. Does the relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature look broken to you from this graph? It certainly doesn't to me. So his claim that the relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature is broken is based on only showing you half the data. When you include all the data, the relationship is just fine. If this sort of trick was used by a scientist, he would be drummed out of the science community for scientific fraud. Lucky for Ben, he's not a scientist. Having dismissed carbon dioxide as the possible source of global warming, Ben goes on to say that solar activity is far better correlated with global temperatures than carbon dioxide. So let's actually take a look at that. Here I've plotted the three of them on the same graph. The top curve, the red curve, is global temperatures, the blue curve is carbon dioxide, and the yellow curve at the bottom is sunspot number, smoothed over an 11-year period. Now, which two of those are better correlated one with the other? I don't think there's even a close competition. Obviously, solar activity has been dropping for about the last 50 years, whereas carbon dioxide and global temperatures have both been going up. 
In science, it doesn't matter what we think or what impressions we get. We have mathematical tests that can prove, one way or the other, whether things are correlated. So here I have two correlation plots. The top one is carbon dioxide versus temperature and has a fairly good correlation coefficient of about 0.72. The bottom plot is sunspot number versus temperature and there's no correlation at all. If anything, it's slightly anti-correlated. The real 800 pound gorilla in the room is the fact that global temperatures can be affected by many factors simultaneously. Some of these short-term factors fluctuate wildly and have no long-term a friend. There are long-term trends in the natural factors that take millennia to have a significant difference. The trend caused by anthropogenic global warming is small but steadily increasing. It can be masked temporarily by short-term natural fluctuations. So why does Ben quote only one side of the argument? Why does he refer to arguments that have long since been debunked? Why does he inflate the qualifications of his so-called supporters? Why does he misrepresent the views of others? Why does he fiddle the numbers? Why does he doctor graphs? I think there's only one simple conclusion to be drawn from all of this. Because he lacks sound arguments to support his case, he has to resort to deception. The US ranks 27th in international math and science literacy. So rather than taking advantage of this situation to create conspiracy theories and pseudoscience, perhaps this is the time to start trying to get the public aware of the wonders and beauty of real science. Ben Davison has a real talent for communicating and making things interesting. What a pity he is not using his talents and the vast resources he seems to have at his fingertips to help inform the public about the excitement of science, the excitement of real science, that is. In part two, I'll be dealing with the attempts by Ben Davison to persuade us that the sun is causing global warming. The mistakes he makes here are even worse than the ones he's made about climate. 